We're continuing this morning in our verse-by-verse -verse study of the Gospel according to John. After introducing John's Gospel two weeks ago, we looked at the first 18 verses. We studied the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. We saw that God entered time and space 2,000 years ago. And then He put on human flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And then last week we looked at one of the greatest men to ever walk the face of this earth. And his name was John the Baptist. Jesus said of him, of those born of a woman, there has never risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. This morning, we're going to look at how Jesus dealt with the people that he met. We're going to see how he began to weave himself into their lives and how, in turn, their lives would never again be the same. That's the plan this morning, but as always, before we talk about the Son, let's bow our heads and hearts and talk to His Father first. <coughs> Father, we come into Your presence knowing that You're here and thanking You for being a personal God. I thank You that it's not just protocol and liturgy, but that You're really real. And our study of John's Gospel has brought that to light. I thank you for the relationship between the beloved Apostle John and Jesus because we're gaining so much from that. It seems like some of the problems that we have are, are self-inflicted, self-constructed barriers that we put up between you and us. And they don't have to be there and they're not real and there's no reason for them. They're not necessary. We have direct access to you at any time. And though you are holy and frightening and a consuming fire and a jealous God, when we want to know your character and your personality, we look to Jesus and we see the love and the kindness and the compassion and the concern and the care, the gentleness, the kindness. <clears throat> Father, we're praying that during this study, we're going to put away our wishful thinking and put away the pictures that we've seen and allow you to paint in our minds and our hearts the real Jesus from your word. As we open your word this morning, Father, we pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, for there are many. We come to this place this morning to see Jesus of Nazareth and him only. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to John chapter 1, and we'll finish up that chapter this morning and move on into chapter 2 next Sunday morning. We'll start at verse 35 and go down through verse 51 to the end of the chapter. The next day, John, and that's John the Baptist, was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who would follow Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. And Peter means the rock. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite, in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. 
Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, in just a minute, we're going to see what happens when we <coughs> go to Jesus. But before we do that, there are three sore thumbs that stick out of this text that we need to take a look at on the front end, so let's do that quickly. Sore thumb number one. I want you to please note in this text that everybody is bringing somebody to Jesus. Look at verses 35 through 37. The next day, John, John the Baptist, was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. John the Baptist brings two of his followers to Jesus, and they follow Jesus. Now go to verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. And then in verse 45, Philip goes and gets Nathanael and brings him to Jesus. Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then especially, I want you to notice Andrew in verses 41 and 42. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Andrew's one of my favorite people in the Bible. He wasn't a great scholar. He didn't author a book of the Bible. He was not an intellectual. He was simply too busy introducing people to Jesus. Did you know that every time Andrew is mentioned in the Bible, he's referred to as the brother of Peter? Without exception. I don't know about you, but I think that would have got old. That would have ticked me off. The brother of Peter. The brother of Peter. The brother of Peter. I'm not the brother of Peter. I'm Andrew. The disciple of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you something. You never hear that out of Andrew. And let me tell you why. Because Andrew had a servant's heart. And then let me tell you the second thing you find out about Andrew when you read the scriptures. Every time you find Andrew in the Bible, he's always bringing somebody to Jesus. Every time. Every time you find Andrew in the, in the scriptures, he's always bringing someone to Jesus. I mean, we just saw in verses 41 and 42 that when Peter came to Jesus, it was Andrew who brought him. And if you move up to the sixth chapter of John, do you remember a little boy who had five barley loaves and two fish? He was shy. But 5,000 people were hungry. And he was willing to offer what he had. And who do you suppose he went to? He went to Andrew. And Andrew took him to Jesus. You'll find that in John 6, 8. And then in the 12th chapter of John, you find the Greeks coming to see Jesus. And they go to Philip, the intellectual. But Philip felt that somebody else ought to introduce him to Jesus. And do you know who that disciple was? It was Andrew. And Andrew took them to Jesus, John 12, 22. In Florida, we called our evangelistic program Operation Andrew because Andrew was always bringing people to Jesus. Listen, some of you here are Christians today because somebody invited you to this church and brought you to Jesus. They invited you here, they introduced you to Jesus and then stepped back and got out of the way so that a relationship could begin. And listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, there are a lot of people all over this community who are looking for that same thing, for that relationship with Jesus. And all they need is someone to take them to Jesus and make it okay. All they need is an introduction. And some of you are already saying, I can't do that. I can't witness. I, I don't have the words. I, I don't have the answers. Listen, can you invite them to church? Can you take them to Jesus? Because you see, They'll meet him when they get here. Everybody was bringing somebody to Jesus, and that's why it works so well. So, what about number two? I want you to please note John's translation from the Hebrew into Greek for his Greek readers. Verse 38. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which is a Jewish word. And then John writes, which means teacher, a Greek word. Where are you staying? And then in verse 42b, when Jesus is talking to Peter, John does the same thing. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter, which means the rock. John again makes sure that his Greek readers understood what he was saying. You know what really gets on my nerves? 
Christian gobbledygook. Religious words that have absolutely no meaning outside of the church when you take them to the world. One time, Dr. Henry Stanford, who's the president of the University of Miami, was speaking, and the university was over budget. And this is what Dr. Stanford said to the press at a press conference that day. He said, we will divert the force of this fiscal stress into leverage energy to prove budgetary prediction and control of our fiscal and administrative procedures. But his assistant turned to the press audience and said, Dr. Stanford meant to say he intends to cut costs. <laughs> We're like that sometimes, aren't we? We use all of the, the Christian words and nobody in the world out there that we're trying to reach understands any of them. Are you a Christian? Don't ask that. The world doesn't know what a Christian is. Are you saved? Saved from what? Have you repented of your sins? Have I paid in my what? You see, they don't understand. And we have to break it down and translate it into their language so that they do understand Over a thousand kids came through our church this past October when we had our fall carnival, our Halloween alternative. And we didn't tell them to come dress like Noah's Ark animals, like most churches do. Why? Because folks that are unchurched, they don't know who Noah is. So they came as ghosts and goblins and monsters and devils, but they came. They came, and that was the important part. We didn't have a holier-than-thou attitude that judged them and kept them away, and they came by the hundreds that night. We were able to love them. We were able to see that they had fun that night in church and invited them back and sent them home with information about Seymour Christian Church. You see, we didn't try and confuse them. When my boys were real young and I'd read them Bible stories at night, before they went to bed, or, or even the Chronicles of Narnia. I was constantly breaking it down and translating it into their young language and understanding as I read to them. John did that with the Greeks in his gospel, and we need to do it with the world out there. To reach the world, we've got to learn to talk like the world. I don't mean cuss, don't lower yourself to their standards, but talk in their terms and language in order to reach them. They don't know what justification or righteousness means. They don't know about the substitutionary death of Jesus. Don't say sanctification or born again to your unsaved friends. Learn to communicate in the language of those to whom God has sent you. Okay, so with number three, I want you to please note Nathaniel's question about anything good coming out of Nazareth. Verse 46. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asks. Come and see said Philip. Come and see. Notice that Philip didn't start beating Nathaniel over the head with a big black Bible. He didn't quote scripture. He didn't recite over 330 Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah to Nathaniel. He just said, come and see. Come and see. Listen, most people are not won to Christ by argument, but by example and illustration. Say it again. Most people are not won to Christ by argument but by example and illustration. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Seymour? Can anything good come out of Brownstown? 1 Corinthians 1.27 is one of my favorite verses. Let me read it to you. God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That's my life verse, folks. God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Isn't, isn't he the son of Joseph, the carpenter? Can anything good come from Nazareth? 1 Corinthians 1.27, God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Acts 5, you remember? They noted that Peter and John were unschooled, ordinary men. 1 Corinthians 1.27, God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Isn't that Joel Lockman, the Maytag repairman's son? 1 Corinthians 1.27, God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. 
God loves to use people from nowhereville. I got this letter later than all of the others, but I still want to share it with you. It was from one of our inmates that we ministered to at Christmas time down at the Jackson County Jail. He wrote this letter and then he sent it home to his mother because he wanted her to buy us a store-bought thank you card to thank us for what we've done for him for Christmas. And the mother writes in here in the thank you card, thank you so much. It really made a difference in his belief of someone caring for him without wanting anything back. He sent this letter for me to mail to you. I want to read the letter. Dear Pastor, Hello, Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year. My name is James Michael, and then he gets his last name. I am incarcerated in the Jackson County Jail. I had my mom give me a personal thank you card for you and for your church. I am in the same pod as Stevie was in. You have a wonderful son. I'm 44 years old and have three children of my own. Your love and kindness overwhelm me. Since being here, I have been baptized for the first time in my life. I go to Bible study on Sunday mornings. I still struggle with the everyday evils. I am constantly reading some sort of religious material beside my daily devotions. I just finished the book Joshua that you sent in to Stevie. Very inspirational. Thank you. In closing, I want to thank you for the Christmas card and the gift. I hope you, your family, and the congregation of your church had a wonderful Christmas and New Year. God bless you all. Respectfully, James Michael. P.S. Tell Stevie I said hello. God bless him. Keep his head up and face up, and he will do well. Miss you, little brother. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything good come from the Jackson County Jail? 1 Corinthians 1.27, God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Notice again how Philip replies. Come and see. That's all he said. Come and see. Can you say that? Come and see my life, Jesus said. Can you say that? Come and see my family. Look what goes on in our home. Can you say that? Come and see. Come to my workplace or my business and see how I conduct my business. Come and see. Can you say that? It's how people are one to Christ. When we can say, come and see how I live my life. Come and see. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. All right, with those appetizers out of the way, on to the main course for this morning, going to Jesus. One of the great things about these verses that we're studying this morning is the insight that John gives us on how Jesus really deals with people. It seems to me that one of the greatest needs of our time is to see the real Jesus rather than the Jesus who is a product of our wishful thinking or the Jesus who is a product of a painter's brush. When Barry DeWitt and I went to Haiti for the first time to preach the services at their National Christian Convention there, we arrived in Port-au-Prince at the airport and we walked into the terminal. We were to meet a young man, a Haitian, named Emmanuel. Emmanuel had just graduated from Bible college and he was in line to take over the mission where the convention was being held. Now, we had never seen Emmanuel before and Emmanuel had never seen us. But when we walked into the terminal, this young Haitian man walked over to us right away, immediately he smiled and said, Barry, Bill, I'm Emmanuel. When we get your luggage, I'll take you to the truck. Now, Barry and I have a good time no matter where we are. So when we got in the truck, I said to Emmanuel, Emmanuel, when we walked into the terminal, how did you know it was us? 
we've never met before. Did we just look super spiritual and clergy-like? And Barry said, oh, or was there this glow and aura about us the moment we got off the plane? And Emmanuel said, no, you were the only two big American white people on a plane full of Haitians. <laughs> now, what the Gospels do for us as Christians is exactly that. The Gospel writers gave us a picture of Jesus. How He really is. So that we can discern how and when He's really working in our lives. I mean, when you're joyful, how do you know that it comes from Jesus or your endocrine glands? You find out by checking the picture that's given to us in Scripture. I mean, if somebody knocks on your door and says they're a representative of Jesus, how do you know whether they're a representative of Jesus or not? Or some hustler. You can tell because you've been given a picture of Jesus if you'll just look at it. If you'll compare the reality to the picture. I sincerely believe with all my heart that a lot of Christians in this church and in the world for that matter, that Jesus is working in a significant way in your life and you don't know it. I'll say it again. I believe with all my heart that a lot of Christians in this church, that Jesus is working in a significant way in your life and you don't know it. And you simply don't know it because you haven't checked out the picture of Jesus given to us in Scripture to know that that's what's happening. Now, we're going to be doing this as we study the Gospel of John over this next year a number of times. Because John gives us a lot of insight into the person of Jesus Christ. This morning, he gives us four things that we need to know about going to Jesus. Let's check them out. First of all, when we go to Jesus, he checks our motives for coming to him. Verse 38. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? What do you want? He asks that always. When we follow him as a Christian or when we come to him as a pagan, he always asks that. What do you want? What are you looking for? Because there are certain things that Jesus doesn't sell in his store, and we need to know that right up front. The other day a man was asking me questions about God. And by his demeanor, his eyes wandering and his voice and his rambling, I could tell that his mind was a million miles away. And I finally stopped him and I said, if you're really looking for answers, I can give them to you. But if you're asking questions because you like to ask questions, then don't waste my time and don't waste your time. You see, God says that too when we go to Jesus. He always asks what do you want? What do you need? There was a time early in my ministry after God had blessed me richly that I thought God was fortunate to have me. I actually thought I had something to do with all of this. There came a time when God stopped speaking to me because I was no longer listening. And the heavens became silent. And the days were dark and dreary and the nights were long and lonely. And then God broke me to pieces. Because you can't build an omelet until you break the egg. And then I came back to God and He said, Son, what do you want? And I said, Lord, I'm so thirsty. And he gave me a drink. And then I said, Lord, I'm so hungry. And he gave me something to eat. And I said, God, I'm scared. And he encouraged me. And I said, I'll never be used to being, will I? And he used me. You see, we want to make a deal with God. We want to determine the answers and set the parameters and tell Him how He's going to work in our lives. And He just doesn't do that because He's God. He's not a bellhop. Why do you come to church? What do you want? A country club or a social gathering? Why are you here? What's your motive? Study the Word of God and get closer to Him because you see, He wants to know. I have a friend who one time had a little growth on his arm. 
He thought it might be skin cancer, so he went to the doctor to get it checked out. And the doctor said, no, it's not cancer. It's really nothing to worry about. And then the doctor said this, but if it gets to where it hurts, come to me and I'll fix it. Jesus says that to all of us who approach him. When it hurts bad enough, come to me and I'll fix it. And second, I want you to see that when we go to Jesus, he allows our questions, verse 38b through 39. They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and reply, and you will see. And so they went and saw where he was staying and spent the day with him. It was about the 10th hour. You know, that's one of the greatest things about Jesus. He allows us to ask questions. He even allows us to doubt. You know, when I discovered that, it was such a relief and such a blessing. Jesus allowed his disciples to come and see to come and see where he was staying, to come and see what he was doing, to come and check him out before they ever said yes and followed him. People ask me sometimes about their doubts. They say, I don't know what I believe anymore. My faith is faltering. I don't know. I don't know how to deal with it anymore. Let me tell you what I tell them. And this is the truest statement I've ever known or ever made. Jesus was always bigger than any doubt I ever had. That's a fact. Jesus was always bigger than any doubt I ever had. You see, Jesus can handle questions. He can handle doubts because he's not afraid of investigation. Check him out. A number of years ago, I bought an insurance policy. And the old guy I bought it from was an absolute joy to be around. He said to me, Bill, this is the best policy you can buy. This is the best coverage you can get at the absolute best price, period. And he said, I don't want you to take my word for it, though. I want you to check it out yourself. And he handed me a bunch of papers. He said, these are my clients that I've had for many years, and their phone numbers are on here. And then he said, here's a list of competitor companies and their phone numbers. I want you to call them. Feel free for a rate quote. And when you're through, you call me back, and I'll write your policy. I checked it out and he was right. And I bought the policy from him because he wasn't afraid of questions. He wasn't afraid of investigation. God's not afraid of your questions either. He invites you to investigate. Come and see. George MacDonald says this, Doubts are the messengers from the living one to the honest. They are the first knock at our door of things that are not yet but have to be understood. <coughs> Doubt must precede every deeper assurance, for uncertainties are what we first see when we look into a region unknown. You know how Satan gets to a Christian? He whispers in your ear, God is mean. God is strict and scary and vengeful. He loves lightning bolts. And if you question or you doubt one thing, he'll throw one your way and sizzle you in your socks. It's a lie from the pit of hell. <coughs> Satan wants to keep you away from God. So he does it with fear. Don't you let him do it. Don't you be afraid. You go to him. You ask him what you need to ask. You check out what you need to check out. You clear up what you need to clear up. Because he's not afraid of investigation from anybody. And then thirdly, I want you to see that when we go to Jesus, he pinpoints our potential. Verse 42. And he, meaning Andrew, brought him, meaning Peter, to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter, which means the rock. You see, Jesus saw Peter's potential the first time he met him. He saw what Peter was going to be before Peter even knew that he was going to follow Jesus. If I'd have been there, I'd have said, You've got to be kidding me. Simon, the fisherman? Earthy and profane, the one with the attitude and the temper, temper, you're going to build your church on him? Come on. He's going to be your rock. He's going to be the, the leader of your followers. Maybe somebody else, but not him. But you see, Jesus saw the potential of Peter. Nobody thought she would ever turn out. Even her parents who loved her and believed in her had their doubts. 
She had trouble concentrating and learning and paying attention when she was little because of a learning disability. It was never diagnosed until years later, which made grade school and high school very, very difficult. <laughs> she was a cut up and a clown, always laughing and getting in trouble every Sunday at church. She hated school. She hated teachers and professors. She thought she'd never graduate high school, but she not only graduated high school, she graduated Bible college as well. She began teaching children in the church when she was just 16 years old. She's been teaching kids now for 38 years. She developed an intensive prayer life at a very early age and formed an intimate relationship with the Father. She wasn't valedictorian and she didn't graduate with honors. But when she turned 26 years old, she began speaking at women's groups and mother and daughter banquets here and there. Her speaking ministry grew and, and blossomed. And 28 years later, she travels all over the United States speaking at retreats and conferences and church services and Bible colleges. She has spoken at the North American Christian Convention five different times and holds the position of children's pastor at her church. She's the most incredible Christian woman that I've ever met. So I married her 32 years ago. Let me tell you something. Jesus saw Love Lockman's potential when she couldn't pay attention or sit still and got in trouble every Sunday at church. Before she was ever born, God knew her better than Moses knew the desert and knew what she would become. And He knows your potential too. And He'll use you for His glory if you'll let Him. Whether you know it or not, or whether you believe it or not, Jesus is here this morning and He's looking at the potential in every one of your lives. And He's wanting to develop it. He's wanting to use you and the talents and the gifts that He's placed inside of you. There's a woman here this morning who's shy and afraid of her own shadow. And she trembles at the thought of ever being used by Christ. <clears throat> but Jesus is here too. And He's named that woman courageous. And she's going to become an explosion for Christ. <clears throat> There's a man here who's just getting off the booze this morning. He's promised a hundred times before, but he always falls off that wagon and then gets back on. But Jesus is here too this morning. And he's named that man faithful. And he's going to use him in a powerful way. There's a young man here this morning. And if you're looking at him, you think he's just a dumb kid who's made a lot of mistakes. But Jesus is here too. And he's named that young man evangelist. And he's going to preach to thousands. <coughs> There's a husband and wife here this morning. They fought all the way here and their marriage is falling apart and they're hiding their anger behind their Sunday school faces. But Jesus is here too and He's named their marriage beautiful. And they're going to be a witness to what God can do with two people that love Him. What am I saying? Simply this, that every believer has a potential and Jesus sees that potential even if you don't. And I don't know about you, but I can hardly wait to see what Jesus is going to make out of me. One time somebody came upon Michelangelo chipping away at a rock. And they asked, what are you doing? And he said, I'm releasing the angel imprisoned in this piece of marble. And God's going to do the same with you. Fourthly and finally, very quickly, I want you to see that when we go to Jesus, He multiplies our efforts. Verses 49 through 51. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Matthew 17, 20, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You see, Nathaniel had very little evidence of who Jesus was. He only had mustard seed evidence. And yet he believed. And Jesus said, I'm going to take that little faith, and I'm going to add to it. And Nathaniel, you're not going to believe what I'm going to do with your life. You've got just a little faith. Push it in the direction of God and see how He multiplies it. 
You only have five loaves and two fish? Give them to God and see how many thousands He can feed with them. You only have a small talent? Give it to Him and watch Him multiply your little into a lot. Let me finish with this. Do you remember the Old Testament when Moses is worried about his credibility with the Israelites? And he goes before God and he says, God, how are they going to know I'm your man? Why would they listen to me? You remember what God does? God says, let me help you. And he says to Moses, Moses, what's that in your hand? And Moses says, what are you talking about? And God says, what's that thing in your hand that you're leaning on? And Moses says, that's my staff. And God said, throw it down. And Moses said, I don't want to throw it down. It's the only one I've got. And God says, throw it down. So Moses threw it down on the ground. And when he does, it turns into a snake. And God says, now pick it up. And Moses said, God, I don't want to pick it up. It's a snake. And God says, Moses, pick it up. And one more thing. When you pick it up, pick it up with a tail. That means that the business end is loose. But Moses was faithful. And he reached down and he picked up the snake. And when he did, it turned back into a staff. But it was no longer Moses' staff. It was the staff of God. When Moses raised that staff up, the Red Sea party. When Moses held that staff up, the Israelite army won its battles. And the world was never the same. What's in your hand this morning? What's in your hand? Give it to God. And watch Him multiply it and turn it into power. Listen. 24 years ago, I came to Jesus because my heart was broken and my life had no meaning. And Jesus said, give it to me. And I said, give it to me. What would you want with a broken heart and a meaningless life? And he said, Bill, you can't even imagine what I'm going to do with your broken heart. Father, I thank you that our reality of you doesn't stop with facts or even our imagination. That you're far more than we could ever ask or imagine. You're the immeasurably more. I thank you that nothing is impossible with you. And that if we say to a mountain with mustard seed faith, move from here to there, it can be done. I thank you that you see potential in us that we don't see. And I thank you that if we're just faithful in stepping forward, that you'll meet us there. You go answer all of our questions and our doubts, and you'll multiply whatever we've got thousands and thousands of times. If we'll just come and see. In Jesus' name I pray.